Sally Wright and Karen McNeil and Beverly Johnson on a piano and a congregation of hundreds and hundreds of <laughs> angels and a few people. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning outside and good morning inside. Should we be inside, Terry? No? Okay. Okay, we're ready to go, Beverly. Um, when the roll is called up yonder. Page 503, everybody, I'm sorry. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more And the morning breaks eternal bright and fair When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead of Christ shall rise and the glory of the resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather on the other side And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there When the roll, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there When the roll, when the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Last verse. Let us labor from the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Amen. Amen. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Good morning, y'all. And Terry's still trying to get all the sounds going. Um, there we go. Yeah, since Jesus came into my heart is a great song. 487. Thank you, Terry. Page four. Hold, hold on. Four, four, eight. <laughs> change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have lied in my soul for as long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy over my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart. Verse 2. I'm possessed with the hope that's and sure since Jesus came into my heart. And no dark clouds of doubt, no the pathway obscure since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy over oh my soul like sea, sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. Amen. Are we all up and going? I huh? think everything's working again. All right. So um, thank you guys so much for your prayers and your patience. And thank you, Karen, for lending your vocal talents. <laughs> oh, we're glad to be here this morning. Still some room out front. We've got a few cars, uh, parking spaces where you can still get in yeah, if right. you'd like. And I was going to say, 
You're on. It is. Okay. I was going to say, if, if you want to go in the back door, you can come in the front, or there's a back side door if someone needs to use the restroom that's out here in the front. So. Well, that's telling them. Yeah. Now, I uh, also want to remind everybody this is Baptismal Sunday. So I'm going to, uh, what we'll do is we'll go through our message, and at our normal time, uh, we'll have our prayer, our prayer of reception of Christ and repentance, and then the radio broadcast will end. We'll go inside, hold our invitation, and then do a baptismal service, which will be about another 15 minutes to the program. But if you like, those of you who are joining us by 106.9 FM out of Plainview, uh, you can go to YouTube and search Jerusalem Community Baptist Church, and you can catch this program live and uh, watch the baptisms for yourself if you like yes. and see the whole service. Amen. So right now, I'm going to give it back over well, to you. But I don't have my paperwork. Well, I go get your paperwork, paper. and I'll stretch. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, th that's good, Sister Millie. If you, those of you that would like, we'll go ahead and do our offering at this point since everything's kind of out of order. Uh, we have a bucket outside and a chair. Just do like Sister Millie. That's our Vanna White. You can uh, just take your offering and put it in the bucket in the chair. Inside, if I can get a couple of people, there's George. I didn't even see George and Mina come in. Slipped right in underneath me. And they're going to pass the basket inside. Those of you listening by radio, if you'd like to donate or pay your tithes, uh, if you've only been listening a couple of weeks, I doubt seriously that you're considering donating, and we understand that. But if you have tithes that you'd like to pay, you can text those to 833 410-0526. Just text the word GIVE and the number is 833-410-0526. It's kind of neat because uh, if you text the word GIVE to this number, it opens up and it allows you to set up your credit card and however you want to give and then it stays that way from then on. And then the next time you text the word GIVE to 833-410-0526, it will just automatically wait for you to put in a dollar amount. You can put 5.00 and it will automatically take $5 from your account and put it into the churches. So easy ways to give, but I've found watching a lot of Christian TV and listening to Christian radio, everybody has made it real easy to give. I don't know why they make it so easy to give. I just wish we could make it easier to get people to come and be a part. But we're glad you're here this morning. And uh, at this time, we're going to invite Sister Sally to come back and let you know what's going on and share a little Jesus calling with us. And then we'll get into the message for this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Terry. Um, of course, welcome to JCBC, Jerusalem Community Baptist Church this morning. If you're joining us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Periscope, and, and of course, now we welcome the listeners on 106.9 um, FM in Plainview. The KKYN listeners and K what is the other frequency? K KRGW? Okay. okay, I think I heard what you said. That's very, the gin is really noisy this morning. Um, but anyhow, welcome to our, our morning service. We are at the uh, corner of E6 Street and Avenue A here in Health Center. So if you want to come on over here, it's, it's real easy to get to. And, of course, this is Baptismal Sunday, and Sister Lisa Salinas is going to be baptized this morning, as well as our brother Aaron Boones is going to be baptized. So we have two baptisms. Yes. Amen. Amen. And uh, please join us here tonight at 6 o'clock for Bible study. We're in the 18th chapter of 1 Samuel, and it's a really, really good study. Tuesdays at 7 p.m., we have home group. And this week we'll be again at our house at 123 East 3rd Street, Monetary's house. And everyone is welcome. And I should include my sister Susie. Susie lives with us too. Um, but everyone is welcome. We'd love to see you there. It's always an uplifting time to share the Lord together and in a very comfortable setting. So hopefully you'll be able to join us. And then Wednesday night, Bible study here at 6 o'clock. We are in the 16th chapter of uh, 1 Corinthians. And Saturday night service, I'm telling you, we have a happening church. We are very active. It's a, we have a lot of things going on. But Saturday night service will be at the city park again downtown. As long as the weather is holding up, that's what we're going to do is um, you know, have it at the city park. It's, really, it's very comfortable, too. And if you, can, you still want to sit in your car, we have the loudspeakers like we have here at the church. That um, We don't have it streaming, but we do have it, um, well, is streaming live on Facebook and YouTube, but as far as on the radio, we don't have it streaming there. But you can um, you know, still join us at 6 o'clock on Saturday nights. 
And one more thing that the, the JCBC does is Monday through Saturday, we have a, a five-minute prayer meeting from seven at 730 to 735, only five minutes long. And Terry leads us in a, a prayer every morning, and it's a great way to start the day. So if you want to join us, just let us know, um, you know, and we can send you the credentials, whether it be on Facebook or um, uh, I don't know any other way except to join us here at the church, and then we can get you the um, credentials to get in there. But uh, we also want to uh, have a special thank you for all the memorials for Ronnie Law that have been coming in. We sure miss our brother in, in the Lord and our friend. And continued um, prayers for Edna and the family. And the, um, the memorials that have come in have really been helping us to be able to continue the, um, the sending out the gospel of Jesus Christ all over the, all over the world, actually. And um, so anyhow, and that's, that's it on that. But I do want to share a Jesus Calling devotional that is, it just really, it got me yesterday morning was from September the 12th. And these books, The Jesus Calling, if you don't have one and you're watching online, you don't have one, we have plenty and we will, we will get you one. So just let me know if you would like to have a copy of it. And of course, they are free. Everything, you know, Bibles, if you need a Bible, we have Bibles. Okay, September 12th. Receive my peace. It is my continual gift to you. The best way to receive this gift is to sit quietly in my presence, trusting me in every area of your life. Quietness and trust accomplish far more than you can imagine, not only in you, but also on earth and in heaven. When you trust me in a given area, you release that problem or person into my care. Spending time alone with me can be a difficult discipline because it goes against the activity addiction of this age. Isn't that for sure? You may appear to be doing nothing, but actually you're participating in battles going on within spiritual realms. You are waging war, not with the weapons of the world, but with heavenly weapons, which have divine power to demolish strongholds. Living close to me is a sure defense against evil. Amen. Amen. And that's all I have. Brother Terry? A lot going on, I have on, a Sally. song. I know Thank we you. usually have a song after this. You know what I'm saying? No. Okay. All right. <laughs> I just want to make sure. That's my reminder to turn the sounds off on my phone, I suppose. Okay. Again, we're so glad that those of you that are with us are here today. I want to do a special shout out to some of my friends in the county jail where we get over, get over to minister as often as we can. Uh, hats off to Sheriff David Cochran, who when everything went on complete lockdown, still allowed us to go to the jail and go inside the outer court and have the men and the women at different times come out onto the activity court and let us preach through the chain link fence. And uh, we've seen more than 14 decisions to come to Christ since COVID. So um, thank you to our high sheriff here in Hell County for being sensitive to the work of the Holy Spirit. And hello to all you guys who are listening on 106.9 there in the county jail. Now, uh, just to take care of one more little piece of business, Sally offered those free Jesus Callings. It's a, a beautiful little book um, with, with great daily devotionals in it. And if you're listening on the radio, you can send your request, and it doesn't put you on a mailing list. We're not like that. All of the services that Sally just announced that we do, we meet in person five or six times a week. We only pass a hat once, and that's here Sunday morning, and we're not trying to get into your pocket. So if you'd like to have one of those Jesus Callings, just send your request. Tell us uh, how you heard about it to Box 112, Hail Center. And you can just put JCBC, Box 112, Hail Center, and our zip code is 79041. 79041. Let's go before the Lord as we get ready to hear this word from Him. Father, we bless Your holy name. How we praise You. We glorify Your name. You are the mighty God of heaven's armies. And Lord, when all hell broke loose against us two minutes before we came on this morning and froze up our computer for the first time ever, 
you caused it to come right back. And we thank you, Lord, that we're on four avenues of the Internet and two FM broadcasts, three stations. Thank you, Lord, that your word is going out. But, Lord, it would be no good at all if we give your word without an anointing. So I humbly ask you, on the account of Jesus, Lord, I ask that you anoint these words and that you anoint your servant as I speak them. That hearts can be touched. And Lord, there's two things my heart cries out for. One, that the lost be saved today. And two, that the cold Christian who's indifferent would come back to you and come alive and have a fire. And I ask these things to the glory of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. The title of the message is Abide. And that may not be too impressive to a lot of people. But it will be when you hear what the Lord has to say about it. And before I get into it and get into the scriptures that are going to take us down through this, I want you to think about something. And it's a scripture that we, we talk about often, Romans 5.20. The Bible says, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Jesus taught the absolute mandate. How I can't, I can't think of the right adjective to how strongly Jesus said we must learn to abide in Him. Why? To be effective Christians. To be effective. To have some use in this life. We don't get saved just to keep our miserable hide out of hell. And we need to know that. We got saved because the Father, in the very beginning, the Father God wanted family. He wants you to be His child. He wants you to sit at His table and dine with Him. And ever since the devil accosted Adam and Eve and ruined this whole thing, which is all a part of his plan to show his love to us. But ever since that happened, man has followed after the things that the devil offers and we get caught up in it. So Jesus, when he came 2,000 years ago, he taught us, you have to abide in me like a, a branch abides to a vine. Otherwise, you're not going to keep nutrients going through you and you're going to shrivel up and die. Now, I want you to think of something. Look around at a, the state of our society today. Look at... Man, in the last few years, don't you walk off and leave your car unlocked. Certainly don't leave your house unlocked. Watch what you say, even to your friends, because they'll get so offended so easily, which Jesus said in Matthew 24 would be a sign of the last days. Even your friends, if they're not your closest friends, you have to be careful what you say because you're going to offend somebody. Whether it's about politics or race or religion or sexuality, you're going to make somebody mad at you. Why has the world gotten in such a mess? There are several ways you could look at why it's gotten in such a mess, but the big question is, is there anything that can be done? Yes, there is. And it's not what you do November 3rd, and I know I'm going to make a lot of people mad right now. Your vote is a good, responsible thing. We've been taught all our lives as Americans that you're right, and that's how you make a, a difference. But that's not going to make any difference in what we're seeing today. It may put a band-aid on something and slow it down or speed it up a little in one way or the other. But we have a sin problem that has taken over this world. And my heart is hungry to ask you, where is the grace that abounds when sin so greatly abounds? Because sin, my friends, is rampant. It's taken your children, it's taken your grandchildren, and it's taken many of you who are watching right now and listening by radio. You're caught up in sin. Some of you may be sitting on a boat holding a cold beer right now as you're listening to this, wondering what's going on. You're caught up in it. And you don't see anything wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with this. Paul told us in Romans 10, 17, where sin abounds, grace is supposed to much more abound. And I'm here to tell you that in you, is the ability, and I talk about it every Sunday, in you as a child of God, if you're saved, if you're sitting in the county jail right now and you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you've got to understand what the Bible tells us in Ephesians 3.19. The fullness of God dwells in you. And when you realize that and start to walk in it, where sin abounds, your grace will go way above it. And all hell coming against you is just something else for you to keep pushing through because you have a purpose in life now. And you have Almighty God, the God of heaven's armies, is your commander. How can you fear? Our fear of death is gone. When you walk in Christ and you walk in the Spirit of God and you realize the fullness of God is in you, and here it is, and you abide in Him, you have no fear of death. 
Oh, grave, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? It has nothing over the child of God. But many of you listeners are scared to death of getting coronavirus. You're afraid that your heart's not going to make it through this next episode. You're in poor health, and I have sympathy to that. I'm a pastor. I spend a lot of my time in hospitals visiting with people, and I understand the frailty of life. But I can also tell you as a pastor, there is nothing more beautiful than going to see somebody who's in peril and their body's breaking down on them and they're still strong as they can be. And it's like, Pastor, pray for me. But don't pray necessarily that I go, well, pray God's will. Because if I go, I go home. And if I stay, I continue the battle. That's, that's who we are. Nothing short of that. But it only comes from abiding. Now let's get into this word abide. And just before we re actually rest on the word, when I got up this morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, got down on my knees to pray over this message, the Lord gave me an amendment to it. It's not chasing rabbits, honey. It's called amendments. Okay. Because okay. God gave me this rabbit. But as I got down and I started to pray in Christ's name, this whole thing of praying in His name again came back to me. And He brought before me, we're told in Hebrews 4.16, that we, children of God, listen to me. If you're born again, if you've ever given your life to Jesus Christ, we actually get to go into the presence of God. It's called the throne room, where it says we can go with confidence before the throne of God where He's sitting, and we can seek mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. Now, a little, a little education. In the Old Testament, in the temple, there was the holy place and then there was the holy of holies. And that's where God dwelt. And only one man, the high priest, could ever go in there. And only once a year. And he had to be cleansed of all his sins. He had to go through all kinds of rituals to even go inside that room. Otherwise, he would die in the presence of God. Because God is holy and we are sinful. That's something you've got to get from the beginning or you don't get any of this. We are sinful and God is holy. Now, interesting thing in that temple, between the holy place where people worshipped and this holy of holies was a veil. And historians say that veil was some nine inches thick of fabrics, just all woven together to make a thick, secure veil. Not a door. God didn't want a door. He wanted a veil. A terrible, breakable door, but thick. And the priest split through that veil and went inside into the presence of Almighty God. Now, the Bible tells us in Matthew 27, verse 50. Let's go there right quick because this is powerful. Almost the last chapter of the book of Matthew. Matthew 27, verse 50. Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. This is Jesus our Lord hanging on the cross. And he cried out with a loud voice and he gave up the ghost. Means that he died. And listen, behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. That's good old King James language. For it was ripped in two, torn in two from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks did rent. And graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection. And they went into the holy city and appeared unto many people. That's a lot of stuff you don't hear about the resurrection a whole lot. Now I could go on and on about it, but that would be rabbits. I'm going to focus on that veil. The veil ripped in two from top to bottom when Jesus died. The minute His Spirit left His body, that veil ripped in two. What happened? What happened there? God was saying, come on in. He just died. He, the wages of sin is death, the Bible tells us. And everything you've ever done, every horrifying sin, everything you're so ashamed of yourself for was laid on His shoulders. The Father turned His back and Jesus cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And God turned His back and then He died. And the moment He died, His Spirit left Him and that veil just ripped wide open and it made a way for you and me to walk through. Now here's what I want you to notice. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 18, Hebrews getting over toward the end of your Bible there. Hebrews 10, 18 says, Now where remission of sin is, where your forgiveness of sin has been, there's no more need for offerings for sin. 
You still have a broken heart when you sin. You still say, oh, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But instead of so much, oh, Lord, please forgive me, please forgive me, he already has. What you should say when you sin is, oh, Lord, I'm wrong. Please help me never do that again. I know what a price you paid for my forgiveness. Help me never do it again. If you have a sin that you sin and you just always go and ask God to forgive you the next day because you know that it's forgiven, you ain't even in there. You may not even be saved. You've got to understand that. If you've been washed and forgiven of all the mess like I've been washed from, if you've actually been cleansed from as bad a mess as I was cleansed from, I don't ever want to do wrong again. He's so good to me, so faithful to me. But he says, where there's, no, where there's remission, there's no more need for, for offerings for sin. Having therefore, brethren, we have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Listen, because here's, here's what this is hinging on. We can now enter into that holy place by the blood of Jesus, by his death being shed on that cross, by a new and living way. Something wholly different here. Completely different. A new and living way which he consecrated. That means which he set aside and made him nothing like it's ever been done. First Adam came, messed everything up. Second Adam came, fixed it all with one swipe of his hand. It says a new and living way that he set aside for us through the veil, now look at this, look at that comma, through the veil, that is to say his flesh. Think on that just for a minute. Jesus came in a body. And the Bible says in Romans 8, 3, it says that he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He came in a body just like ours. He came, get this, this is hard for you to swallow, especially if you're pretty religious. But he came in a lifestyle, even though like Sally likes to point out, he did not have our sin nature as such, because he was, his father was God, but he still came through Mary. And that whole lineage goes back. He had a sin, a likeness of sinful flesh, just like ours. You've got to understand that the horrible things that you want sometimes, oh, I shouldn't want that, that's so sinful. Jesus had those same desires. But all his life, he said, no, no, no. And he never, ever, once even allowed it to move into temptation to take him. But he had the desires because the Bible tells he was tempted in every way, even like as we are. But he was in this flesh. He took one of these bodies just like ours. That body got hungry. That body got to stinking, needed a shower. That body got sore when he worked too hard. It got burned by the sun. And he saw things that he wanted that he shouldn't have. And he said, no. And from the time he was a little boy, he came up in the temple and he learned the Word of God. You've got to know the Word of God if you're going to walk and abide in Christ. There are no two ways about it. If you don't know the Word of God, and if you don't have a hunger for the Word of God, and if you don't desire to put it in your heart, please hear me. Cry out to him and say, Father, what's wrong with me? I'm not desiring your word. Change me. He'll answer that. Do you have children? If you had a child that just couldn't do right, but they came to you with tears in their eyes and says, Daddy, I want to do better, but I can't. Help me. Help me. I don't, I don't know how to do my chores. I, I, can't, I can't discipline myself. I need you to help me. You'll do anything to help that child. If you see, they mean it. But if you don't get into reading the Word of God, and if you don't hear the Word of God, you will have no faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, Hebrews eleven six, And yet Romans ten seventeen says, faith comes by hearing. You've got to hear the Word of God. So you've got to get the Word of God into your heart. Now what it tells us here, Jesus is the Word of God. He came in flesh. The Bible says in John chapter 1, I don't know exactly the verse, but it says that, the Word became flesh. That's within the first five or six verses. The Word became flesh. Jesus came in a filthy old body just like ours, tempted to do wrong and never would do it. He broke every rule of sin this world threw at Him. Every one of them. And He stayed true to His Father. And He walked a pure and holy life. What did it get Him? Did it get Him a better job? Did it get Him the corner office? Did it get Him a new car? Did it get him all of his friends that he wanted? Did it give him influence so others would want to be like him? You're listening to that from a preacher. You need to find another church. It got him spit on. It got him mocked. It got him ran out of town and ultimately it got him executed. But when he was executed, that veil split wide open because God was doing something that we just don't have our minds wrapped around yet. What happened when Jesus died, the Bible says there in Hebrews, that we can now go through that veil into the presence of God. It's because Jesus' body, 
Listen, <laughs> this is so good. It's so simple at this point. His body, the man, Jesus, with the beard and the hair, the whole thing, his physical body that no doubt had calluses and scars, it was like a veil. On this side is you seeking God. And you're wanting, to, you're wanting to get to God. Job talked about this. He said, I need someone to be a go-between between me and God. I can't get to Him. He's holy. Jesus stood there with His body just like a veil. And His body's here. And you're there with sin. And His Father's right behind Him. Holy and pure. Wanting to reach you. But you've got sin. And you're wanting Him. But He's holy. You can't touch And Jesus stands there in the middle. And He walked a sin-filled world for 33 years and ripped every gear that it had trying to make him sin and he didn't do it. And then he took the penalty for all of the sins and swallowed it. It ripped his body in half, the spirit and the flesh, just like that. And God said, come on in. You're now free to come stand before me because of what my son did on that cross. And it ripped the spirit from the flesh apart and now we can go right in between and the Bible says, when, listen, this is why you say in Jesus' name. Because when I come to go into the presence of God, I realize I'm walking through what Jesus did on the cross. And the Bible says when He sees me come in there, it looks like He sees Jesus coming in. Do you realize that when the Father looks at you, He sees Jesus when Jesus looks at you, He sees how you're living here on this earth. And I could go into a whole other message about that. The Bible says that all judgment has now been given to Him because He's the one that stood here and suffered all this. And there will be a judgment for Christians. And the Bible says that we will give account for everything we've done. You call yourself a Christian, you think it's all washed and gone away. It is in the Father's eyes. But you're going to stand before Jesus Christ, the Almighty Judge. And it says some are going to enter heaven as if by fire. There will be nothing left. Everything they've done is watching football, drinking beer, going fishing, hanging out with buddies, never ever getting into the Word of God. Maybe they really got it, maybe they didn't. If they did, they'll get there and everything will be wiped away from them and they'll walk into heaven bare naked. While this book is filled with people telling us how to abide and how to walk in Christ, how to rescue the perishing, pull your family members out, raise children that will raise up in the admonition of the Lord, raise up children that will know what to do when the things that tore you up start to come against them, and they will. And they'll come against them way harder than they came against you. I'm 61, and I can't imagine what young people are going through today. I talk to these kids at jail, and I think, I, I wouldn't have made it. I would have been in the same shape they're in right now, or worse. I don't know how they navigate through and, and stay alive. And to those of you in that age group, 20s and 30s, your kids, you cannot even, you can't even fathom what's poised to be the world that they're going to come up in. Unimaginable. So we have this way now. We've been bought to come into the presence of God. So what do we do when we get there? Turn with me now to the main text of the message. John chapter 15. The fourth gospel. John chapter 15. And start at verse 1. Red letters. Jesus talking to us. Oh, please keep in mind when we read this holy word of God. This is all divinely inspired. The Word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, Hebrews 4.12. And Isaiah 40 verse 8 says, The grass will wither and the flowers will all fade, but the Word of God will go on forever. It's the only truth you'll ever get in your hand. And right now, when you read these red letters, do you realize there were men who'd studied the Bible their whole life? They were called Pharisees. And there were Sadducees and scribes who wrote all of these holy things down. They looked Jesus square in the eye and didn't know that he was God and they argued with him. They argued religion with him. They argued religion with Jesus. The one who wrote everything, who is everything that we read. Well, this is him speaking. So may he who has ears to hear... May she who has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit says to you today. This is Jesus talking. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. 
Jesus says, I'm a vine in the garden and my Father is taking care of it. He wants fruit. My Father wants fruit. And I'm His vine. I'm His vine and he, my Father wants fruit to come from me and He wants things. Have you ever had a garden? Boy, you get so thrilled when you get that first little tomato bud out there. You run over and knock on your neighbor's house. Come here, come look at it. What, what? They think the house is on fire. They get you over in a little bitty green tomato. What's the matter with you? Look, look. God is the gardener. Jesus is his vine. And I'm going to tell you something. When you raise a holy little child, a child that starts quoting scripture when they're four or five years old, God says, look at this tomato. Look at what they've done. Look at the fruit coming out on this vine. Hallelujah. That's what we're here for. Isaiah 60, verse 3. 61, verse 3. 61, 60, verse 3. I didn't write it down. It says, He gives me beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for my mourning, the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness, so that we can be trees of righteousness, planted by the Lord that He might be glorified. Your trees, your vines. It's all in, he, he uses that kind of thing over and over. So are in the seeds. Jesus liked to talk about things like that because His Father sees this as a garden. And we're plants. And we're tied into Jesus. He's the vine. You're not going to produce outside of him. You can produce all you want to, but it's not good fruit. You're not going to have it. So he says, every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. Now, I've told you before, and I'll tell you again. And those of you that are listening on the radio may have never heard me say this. We're a little Baptist church, but I'm not going to tell you once saved, always saved. I don't know. And if you tell me you do know, I doubt you. And if you've gone 14 years of seminary and you tell me you know, I still doubt you. Because I can preach from the same Word of God all day long. I won't. But I can preach here all day long that if you're not walking and producing fruit, you're not saved at all and you're going to hell. But I could also preach all day long that once you're saved, you've got a mark on you and you'll always be saved. I don't, I don't know. And I think that he left it kind of like that so he'd keep you on your toes. What if you went through life with your marriage? Well, I know. I know I married her. I married her and she comes from a long, let's say a long Catholic background. And she will not divorce me. I know it. So I'll go out and live any way I want to. What a shameful reprobate you are. This should be an act of love. But he says right here, every branch that doesn't bear fruit, he throws it out. But the branch that does bear fruit, he purges it. So that it'll bring forth more fruit. Now, where are you going to get off saying that God's going to get you a new BMW? And God's got, that doesn't sound like purging to me. Oh, God's going to get me a new 80, 88 inch TV screen and a big TV because I've been good. I've been to church several times. I started tithing, so God just washed me with money. I'm going to go out and buy me some goodies. That's not purging. You know what purging is? That's when you start cutting off the limbs that are just kind of just kind of hanging on there and they're not bringing anything to the table, so to speak. So you cut them off. What does it do? What does it do when you purge? If you've got a limb here and it's got a few apricots on it, you've got another one over here that's got a few buds and some apricots and blossoms, and you've got four or five other branches that are just kind of leaves and they ain't doing anything. The leaves are kind of brambled up. You cut them off. You cut them off. Why? Because then all those nutrients that are coming up from the bottom aren't being distributed and all this wasted stuff, it goes straight to the ones that are making fruit. So God says, here it goes again. Here goes the preacher. Going to start in on TV again. Turn off your television. Quit watching that filth. That's your branches. And all you're doing is, but even if they're clean, even if they doesn't have all the sex and violence, which there's not a handful of them anymore unless you watch old TV shows. And they're a waste of time. Even the old ones. You got your branches all out here. You're, you're bringing all this stuff in and the branches are just sitting there while the other branches you're trying to do right in the Lord. But you got all these branches soaking up all your resources. He says, I'll cut them off. And if you come to him and you say, I want to abide in you, he'll start cutting those things off. And if you come to Jesus and mean it, you don't have to hear the preacher say, turn off all that television. Cancel your Netflix. Quit listening to the secular radio. I tell you that all day long because I want your well-being. But all you have to do is say, Lord, I want to be a good plant. I want to be a plant that will produce much fruit. I want to be a plant that will cause you to go tell the neighbors, come look at your plant this morning. I want to be that. And you know what he'll do? He'll start shaving away some of those things. Some of the things that you do, you'll just find yourself, I'm not going to watch that anymore. I'm not going to waste two hours of my time watching this show. Why do I want to, well, listen to this word we use, why do I want to binge 
on something that's not even going to make my leaves green. You're a tree planted by rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. Psalm 1, read that one and get it in your heart. Instead, he, in his law, he meditates day and night. You want to be a good vine. You want to start producing fruit. Well, Terry, I don't know about this. You're really giving me a hard thing. No, 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 no. Listen, the fruit, the Bible says all through here, you even get to eat of your own fruit. It says, don't muzzle the ox. Let him eat on the threshing floor. When you produce this fruit, what, well, what do you mean? How do I get to eat my own fruit? I'll tell you right now. You listen to what I'm saying. You take what we're saying and you learn to abide in Christ. You start letting him prune you and cut off these branches that aren't producing right. And your life starts changing. First thing that happens, some of your friends start saying, well, I don't even want to hang around with them anymore. They're weird. They don't even like to watch the old Seinfelds with me. They don't even want to watch Friends anymore. And you don't say anything. Just take it and go on. But you keep going and you keep going. And next thing you know, your children are starting to do godly things. And you see it, and they come home, and maybe they're 14 years old, and one of them says, Mama, my friend asked me to get high with him today, and he had some dope. What'd you do? I told him I'm a Christian, and I don't think I should do that. That's eating your own fruit. That's when you realize you've been obedient, and your child, you didn't even have to, I'll beat you to death if I see you getting high. You didn't have to do that. Because you're getting nourished from the living water, and you're producing fruit, that just naturally shows up in your children. Some of you had that. Some of you have been that fruit because of godly great-grandparents and grandparents. And we've thrown it all out the door. Well, I believe in God. What God? Tell me who He is. Is He the God of this Bible? Can you tell me how salvation works? How did you get saved? What did Christ's sacrifice mean to you? How did it happen? Most people can't answer those things, and yet they're expecting for heaven to split open for them someday and welcome them in. How many of us can't wait to go on a vacation that we've never really heard much about the place, we've never been there before, and we're not sure of who's there. And yet we're all sure we're going to heaven. We need to know it. How can, if you're really serious about this, you want to know everything you can possibly know about heaven. You want to know who's there. You want to know how you're getting there. You want to know what it's going to be like. And He wants you to know. And He says, Now you're clean through the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me. And I'll abide in you because the branch, verse 4, chapter 15, verse 4 of John, the branch itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except you abide in me. You, can't, you cannot produce fruit if you don't abide in Christ. Well, Terry, I don't know about all this abiding, but I go to church and I pay tithes. And now and then we even go visit some people. It doesn't matter. Do you know there are organizations that deny God? Atheist organizations that do good. That's not fruit. That's just good works. And we could have another whole sermon about good works. They're, they're useless. It's good for your society, but it's not, it's not gaining you anything in the kingdom of God. Verse 5. I am the vine. This is our Lord Jesus talking. I am the vine. You're the branches. And he that abides in me. This is the name of our message. He that abides in me, Jesus said, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Okay. Now, if you abide in him, why is it two different things? Because we read just a minute ago in Ephesians 3.19, 18 and 19, that the fullness of Christ dwells in you. Or the fullness of God. It says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. So he's in you. If you're saved at all. But are you in him? He said two different things there. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him. Now he abides in you, but do you abide in him? Don't answer that too quickly. He says, he that abides in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Go back to verse, chapter 12, verse 46. Jesus is talking to believers. And some of these things, it's, it's like I tell our congregation, when you study the Bible, when you read it, as you're reading, don't just read it so you can say you got your Bible reading. Done. Who's he talking to? What's he saying here? What was God thinking when he gave us these words? What, these particular words, when he says 
that I'm a, I'm a branch of the vine. What, what did he mean? Why did he use that? Ask God. You have the author living in your heart. He wants to make this good to you. You don't need Bible studies. You don't need great theologians. You don't even need preachers. They're helpful. They get you going. They get you moving. But you need the Holy Spirit in you. You may find out you are a preacher. Chapter 12, verse 46. Listen to this. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. You're abiding in darkness until you abide in him. Well, Terry, I think I do abide in him. Don't be too quick to say that. Abiding. When I looked up the word, currently, in today's contemporary English, to say you abide means to say you obey. Now, that's hard enough. In the older, older way, of the, the older vernacular and, and, and speaking in, in older language, to abide would mean like to stay. I'm going to stay somewhere. And I think they both fit. Now, in the Scriptures, it was mostly to stay, to abide somewhere. I'm going to abide with Him for four days. I'm going to stay here four days and stay with Him. So that is one type of abiding. The other abiding is to obey. I'm not going to abide by that. Well, I am, they got a new law about doing something. Well, I'm not going to abide by that. Well, I am going to abide by that. That's to obey. So see, the word has a couple of definitions, and they both, I'm getting warm out here, they both apply very well here. But to abide, hear me. Oh, dear Christian, wayward soul, who hasn't come to church just because you don't feel like coming to church, but you're listening, praise God. Hear me. To abide in Christ <laughs> I got to tell you, it's an acquired thing. It's something that as you start to do it and you start to, you start to love on the other people of God and you actually start to hear. And when the Word of God spoken and something hits you and it didn't get anybody else in the room and you get it and then you share it with them and everybody gets chilled. By, it's an acquired thing. And next thing you know, you want to be closer. You want to always be in His presence. You go out on walks and you're talking to Him. And you, I know it sounds nutty, but again... Look at what the devil's doing. He's right out in the open with everything. And the Christians are all, well, I don't want to look like a fanatic. I do. I want to be, listen, listen to this, because this is how Christians ought to be looking at this. I want to be as bright in the light as the devil is dark in his darkness. People are being killed in the streets by other Americans right now. Men marrying men, women marrying women, parents having their kids come home saying that their friends are gay and they can't say anything bad about it because it'll make their children mad at them. We are backwards. We're lost. Because we're so afraid of being radical or being a little out of line that we want to just close ourselves in. Can't do that. You abide in Christ and one day you'll come to realize a lot of people like to say this, but very few of them mean it. Can you say, now think about it, I don't care what anybody thinks about me. I make my own mind up. My mind has repented. I've turned. I'm following Christ. If you don't like it, you can go butt a stump. Because you're going to have people laugh at you. You're going to have people make fun of you and poke fun. But what happens, as I've told you before, over time, they sin. They want to, most people want to see it in you. I never thought old Terry would be doing such and such. Well, I never thought of that. So they eyeball me and mock me. I walk in a restaurant and they kind of find an exit door. I don't mind. I don't mind. You just keep on doing the same thing and keep being faithful because they're watching you. And I can tell you from experience, after four or five years, some of those very same people will be coming to you saying, will you pray for my grandma? Will you pray for my mama? Because they saw it was real and it didn't waste away. It comes from abiding in Him. I don't care what you think of me. I'm looking out for number one and that's not me anymore. I'm looking out for number one's interest because he gave everything to bring me into his. And you don't get it overnight. You're a seed. You put your faith in Jesus Christ and you abide in him. And as you abide, you come out of the darkness that you've been abiding in and you start getting into the light. And a natural thing that happens, you start wanting to be around other people who are in the light because you, you want to be with people that you like. And you start to find a new love this little congregation is the funniest looking bunch of people. They know two people. Oh, what? I'm one of you. We're all different. We're all different. We can hear you. We're all different. 
And I don't think I've ever loved anybody as much in my life as the people here. It's just awesome. But I don't care what anybody thinks. I care about this and I care about them. I care about my brothers and sisters. That's what God has for us. Now, as we wind this up, go over to 1 John. This still same author we've been reading from who was quoting Jesus and, and, and telling us things that he observed Jesus saying. 1 John chapter 2. This is where it gets hard, and it's why I didn't want you to answer too quickly if you're saying you're abiding in him. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. The Bible says, And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. Uh oh there we go again. Well, I'm a Christian. Do you keep his commandments? Yeah. Well, I thought you said you hated this person. Well, I do. I can't stand them. Then you're not keeping his commandments. You can't say you're his. This, you take this on deal with it yourself. I won't preach on it. I'll just read it again. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He saith, I know him. He that saith, I know him, but keepeth not his commandments is a liar. And the truth's not in him. Verse 5. But whoso keepeth his word... In him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him, uh-oh, ought himself also to walk even as he walked. Talking about Jesus. Now, do you still say you abide in him? Well, Terry, now, do you abide in him? Does anybody abide in him? Yes and no. Yes and no. Yes and no. I'll tell you it like this. I abide in Jesus Christ more today than I did yesterday. And I abide in Him far more than I did a month ago. And I abide in Him tons more than I did two years ago. And if I live another 20 years, I'll abide in Him so much more. Every day you come a little closer. We have a saying around here, if you don't want to backslide, then keep moving forward. You'll never roll backwards if you keep moving forward. But it's when you sit still. And you start taking it easy a little while. And you go back to doing the things that you like to do. You're going to start going backwards. You can't sit still. You're going forward or backward at all times. Jesus said he's for me or he's against me. Go over one more chapter and we'll hit our last scripture. John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 6. Whoso abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even he is righteous. If you're not doing righteousness, you're not considered right. Well, what are we talking about, Terry? Nobody's perfect but Jesus. Keep reading. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested or shown to us all. He brought here to this earth so that, we, so that he might destroy the works of the devil when he let his body be rent in twain. When his body was torn in half, he destroyed the works of the devil. Now whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Now in this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither is, he that neither is he that loves not his brother. Okay, now those last two verses, if you wrote anything down, or if you take anything away from this today, we're going to hinge on these two as we wind up. The first one, 1 John 2, 3 through 6 says, If you abide in him, you ought to walk like Jesus walked. And you say, well, nobody can do that. Nobody's perfect but Jesus. Let me tell you something. When you walk in the Spirit, you are incapable of sinning. That's why we need to be learning to walk in the Spirit more every day. Galatians 5.25 says you live in the Spirit, learn to walk in the Spirit. So you come to Him and you say, I want to... That's why He said abide. The long, when you're abiding, you're incapable of sinning. You cannot sin when you're abiding in Christ. It's a decision you make today. A decision that you make right now. Lord, I want, I want to be... I want to be a vine. I want to be a branch on the vine that you can be proud of. I want to experience peace in this crazy world. I want to be a soldier in your army. I want to go out. I want to get up in the morning and see how dark things are. And instead of retreating back and saying, Oh, Lord, give me strength today. I want to get up in the morning and say, Lord, let me know your presence as I abide in you. And let me go out into the darkness and take the light. I am not a defensive player anymore. I'm a son of the God of heaven's armies. And God has that for you. And when you walk in that knowledge, and when you walk in that truth, you do not sin. 
you're incapable of sinning. But Paul said, I haven't made it yet. I haven't gotten where I'm there all the time. But one thing I do, I forget what's behind me and I look forward to what's ahead. If that's you, pray this prayer with me and God will hear you right now. Father in heaven, I need to know you. I need to abide in you. I'm not sure after what I've heard if I'm saved or if I'm not saved. I just know that I'm not walking the way the preacher said. And I know that you have more for me. I'm asking you, Father, to accept my hungry heart and draw me into your presence, Lord. Draw me in and wash me by the blood of Jesus. I want to go through the veil of his flesh. I believe everything I've heard today. And I'm asking you, Lord, to draw me into your vine and start purging away the unproductive branches. I want to be a part of you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed something like that, we're going to have an invitation now at the front of the church. After the invitation, we're going to have the ordinance of baptism. And you can watch that on your YouTube or Facebook feeds if you like, or anybody that's in the parking lot, you're most welcome to come on inside. Right now, I'm going to ask those of you who have a decision to make to not put it off any longer. You know, when we say that Jesus was the veil and that he was ripped in two, that was painful. It wasn't painful that his, like his arm was being torn from his body. I'm sure that that was very painful as well. But his spirit and his soul were torn apart. The flesh, listen to this, the part of him that was torn apart that was capable of sinning. Jesus had a part of him that was capable of sinning. He was tempted in every way as we were, but he never did it for 33 years. Listen, this is what happens to you. It was peeled off of him when it was rent in twain. And all that was left was what Mary saw in the tomb. And she didn't know it was him. She couldn't even recognize him without that sin nature on him, without that sinful flesh abiding, that he never sinned, but it was still that old Adam part. And she looked at him and she said, If you're the gardener, tell me where you've taken him. And Jesus looked her in the eyes and said, Mary. And she said, My Lord and my God. Oh, hallelujah. God's doing that for you right now. And he's saying, I want to tear that apart. Tear that old flesh from the Spirit. And start to walk in the Spirit. And I'm going to tell you now, you can't do it without the help of a body. And you can't do it without the Holy Spirit living in you. Now, if you want to make that decision, now's your time. I want to ask everybody to stand. Everybody, please stand. And we're going to have a round or two of the invitation. And if you'd like to give your life to Jesus Christ this morning, if you'd like to become a Christian for the first time, you walk this aisle, and we'll pray together with you. The water is warm and clean. We can baptize many as need to be here. If it's street clothes, we'll dry you off and send you home. And if you're already a child of God and you know, I have not been abiding. I have not walked in this. But I want to. I want to know the victory. And I want to be an offensive player. I want to make a difference in this dark world. Now's your chance. As Beverly softly plays, let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for the invitation you offer right now for us to come to you. Holy Spirit, we pray that if there's someone in this room that's not sure, if there's someone here who's doubting, and they want to put their flag in the ground right now. Lord, give them the courage to, to step out of that aisle. To step out of that pew and come down the aisle. And say in front of their brothers and sisters, I'm decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. If that's you, I invite you to come right now. play one more time and let's sing it together I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back. Amen. Well, if I can ask Sister Lisa.
go back this way and Brother Aaron to go back that way. Then I'll come get your monitor set back up and we'll observe baptism. Just take us a couple of minutes too. All right. Let's go with Sister Lisa first. Ladies first. Very warm water this morning. Whoop. There you go. Good for the handle, huh? Yeah. All right. Oh, praise the Lord. This sister has been hungry for more Jesus. We've been watching her. And the devil has pelted her with family and friends and everything you can imagine. But doesn't he do that? Look at her system this morning trying to break down her videos. But she's come to a point. She realizes it's battle and she wants to fight this battle. But she wants the Lord to fight it for her. She's given up. And she's laid her arms down. And she's asked the Lord to take his up. So my sister Lisa... Have you made a final decision to seek God with all your heart? I have. And you want nothing more than to please Him? Pleasing all Him. And you have given your life to Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Yes, I have. Okay, put your left hand on your nose. Did I say yeah, that will work. Oh, in observance of our obedience, in obedience to the commands of Scripture, and upon my sister's public profession of faith in Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my sister in Christ, Lisa Salinas, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <laughs> God bless you. Oh. Mm. Buried in sin, raised to new life. That's right. Amen. Oh, God bless you, sister. Very careful going out. As Sally was pointing out there, this is symbolic, and it's a beautiful symbol. Because you, you die to your old life, and this water is like the burial grounds. And I make sure when I bury somebody, they go all the way under, completely under. If it was Eddie, I'd hold him under there a while, but we don't have to do that for everybody. But you're completely closed off to the world. You're buried to the world. The old life stays there and then you're raised up to new, new life in Christ. And now, my brother Aaron. Oh, brother, what an honor. Aaron, been seeking the Lord for a long time. You've been giving your faith to Christ a long time ago, hadn't you? He told me he's been... He's been praying. He's had a lot of questions on his heart. He's not sure what the Lord's been telling him, but he wants to get things right. And he wants to do what the Scriptures want him to do. And he's got a church family here that's going to pray for him to walk that way. He wants to walk away from the old and start with the new, so he's going to leave it here in the water today. And you've given your life to Jesus Christ, and you decide Him to be Lord of your life forever. Amen. Right hand, hold your nose, either one. I'll get you back up one way or another. Now hold the elbow with this one. In obedience to the Holy Scriptures, and upon your public profession of faith before your family and friends here, your faith in Jesus Christ, I'm given the great honor of baptizing you, my beloved brother in Christ, Aaron Boones, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's okay, come on down. All the way under there we go. Oh, there you go. You didn't have faith in an old preacher. I've done this before. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you so much to our brothers. Is there anybody else who wants to get in the water? All right. That will have us a prayer, and that will conclude our, our service this morning. Keep us in prayer for our equipment. We don't know what's going on, but we have another computer starting next week. So, Father, we thank you for the glory. We thank you for the wonderful fruit that we've seen of this little church. And Lord, we believe that it's direct result of abiding in you. And we ask you, Lord, to keep drawing us closer, closer to you. And if there's anybody listening, anybody watching that desires to be closer, Lord, draw them here and let this family grow as we lift up your name. Go with each one as we go and may your word continue to come alive in our hearts. To the glory of Jesus we pray. Amen. God bless you. Services start at 6 o'clock tonight. You're dismissed.